About 3,000 years ago, a people known as the Etruscans migrated from Eastern Europe to Central Italy and set up a federation of 12 city-states. Today, their old neighborhood is known as Tuscany, and its cities are some of the most famous in Italy. Florence, Pisa, and Siena are Tuscan cities. The Etruscans had a highly developed society, great art and architecture. They also had a strong fleet that traded with the Syrians and the Greeks. They traded in Africa and in Spain. Etruscan tin and copper went out. Ivory, precious jewels, and textiles came in. But by the beginning of the third century, the Roman legions had become so strong that they were able to crush the Etruscans and eventually incorporated all of Etruscan society into the Roman Empire. However, the great cultural traditions of the Etruscans remained in place. It was the citizens of Tuscany who triggered the rebirth of art and architecture that we call the Renaissance. Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, Botticelli, Raphael, everybody who was anybody in the Renaissance was working in Tuscany. Tuscany is still home to artists and writers who find inspiration in the magnificent landscape and the unusual light. During the 9th century, the Tuscan hill town of Siena became a major stopping point on the road between Paris and Rome. By the beginning of the 12th century, it was a bustling city, producing some of the best wool in Italy, developing a clothing industry, and exploiting a small silver mine. By the end of the 12th century, Siena was a commercial and financial center, and her growing economic success began to challenge the city of Florence, which was only 30 miles to the north. An emotional competition developed between the two cities, which eventually led to the Battle of Monteperti in 1260. Siena won the battle and entered a period of extraordinary power, power which rested in the hands of a small group of influential families. One way the families showed their newfound wealth and influence was the construction of magnificent fortified palaces. The city's location on the road to Rome gave it a commercial advantage, but it also made it a resting place for pilgrims. If you were on your way to the Vatican from virtually any part of Europe, you made a stop in Siena. The city began building a series of outstanding churches, towers, and public squares. And since most of the modern construction has taken place outside the old city, Siena's character remains relatively unspoiled. Narrow winding streets and ancient buildings give Siena a distinct medieval feeling. During the past 3,000 years, dozens of different ethnic groups have immigrated to the peninsula that is presently called Italy. And each immigration made a contribution to the cooking of the land. But there were three groups that set the foundation, which eventually became what we now call Italian cooking. The three groups were the Greeks, the Saracens, and the Etruscans. The Greeks arrived over 2,000 years ago and set the base for all southern cooking. The Saracens popped in around 700 AD and superimposed a whole bunch of ideas on top of the Greek base. The Greeks and the Saracens were the primary influences on the cooking of the South. The North was controlled by the Etruscans, and the center of the area which they controlled eventually became known as Tuscany. When it comes to food, Siena has all of the traditional dishes of Tuscany, but its greatest strength is in its sweets. The Saracens brought sugar to Italy, and about 10 minutes later, Siena had a sweet tooth. Its most famous sweet is panforte, which means strong bread. Panforte is a medieval spiced bread made from candied orange peel, lemons, almonds, hazelnuts, sugar, and honey. It is made by a number of bakeries in Siena and shipped to Italian communities throughout the world. Perhaps the most famous baker of Panforte is Nanini, who also has a number of retail shops throughout the town. Wherever there is an Italian community, there is Panforte. And right next to the Panforte are Ricciarelli, little cookies that are made from almonds, egg whites, and sugar.
Starting in the year 1000, Europe saw an enormous increase in its population, and people started moving into the cities. The hot towns were Milan, Venice, and Florence. And as more and more people moved into the cities, the merchants became wealthier and wealthier. Suddenly, there was a large group of people interested in buying good stuff. And at the top of their shopping list was wine. By the early 1300s, each resident of Florence was on average knocking off a gallon of wine per week, with much of that wine coming from the nearby vineyards in Tuscany. And the word Chianti was already being used to describe the land between Florence and Siena. For most of its history, Italy was made up of small independent states. Each had its own approach to business with separate currencies, weights, and measures. That, plus a mind-boggling system of import and export duties, made it impossible for Italy to develop an international or even a national market for its wines. And the quality of the wine remained uneven at best. But during the middle of the 19th century, things began to change. The city-states became a single nation. Well, at least in theory. The wine producers of Tuscany introduced quality standards and soon developed an international reputation. Michael Yurch is the president of Sherry Lehman in New York City. It's considered to be one of the world's great wine stores. He's also a leading authority on the wines of Italy. I asked Michael to come with me to Tuscany and share his expertise. Government regulations on wine are uh, both good and bad. It's a good thing that it guarantees what the wine is made out of, guarantees where it's from, how it's made, and sometimes regulations are bad because, I mean, if you can imagine a government regulation, if, if you equate winemaking with art, if you can imagine a law that told a painter what color to paint with, that's sort of what we have here making wine. <laughs> this is why 20 or so years ago, some winemakers just totally broke with the government regulations and said, we're going to paint with the colors we want, we're going to make wine with the grapes that we want, and we're going to make great wine. And if you don't want to officially sanction it for us, well, that's too bad. We'll just call it table wine, vino di tavola, but we're going to make the best wine in Italy, and we're going to show that the government regulations aren't the be-all and end-all on how to make wine. And of course, the proof of wine is in the glass, not on the label. Although, from a consumer standpoint, the wine regulations do offer a good degree of protection. During the 1970s, Italian winemakers were more interested in quantity than quality. They hit the bottom of the barrel. Back in the bad old days, these folks were getting 20 or 30 or 40 tons per hectare in some instances. And now, eight is more typical for a good quality table wine, especially here in Italy. The concept of less is more has taken hold to where it's not good to have so many tons per hectare. During the summer, their workers come through and examine all the clusters, and they only pick the best ones and leave the best ones on the vine. This one didn't make the cut, or literally did make the cut. It's called dropping fruit, and what it does, it concentrates the grapes that are left. It gives the vine more vigor to pump into the grapes that are remaining. How are they? They're pretty sweet. Sweet? Ready for picking. Call me as soon as it's time to drink. The most important of the traditional grape varieties in Tuscany is the Sangiovese. The word comes from a Roman phrase that means the blood of Jupiter. They also planted grape varieties that were traditional to France, like Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, and Merlot. The winemakers concentrated on the quality of the grapes and they blended the wine that came from the Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, and Merlot with wine that came from the Sangiovese. Sangiovese has been around longer than the Romans and probably longer than the Etruscans. It is the most widely planted red grape in Italy, but uh, here it makes a wine that is firm in acidity, cherry flavors, tea flavors, but most important, it's a grape that makes a wine that goes well with food. The giant Slavonian oak tanks that were used for hundreds of years in Italy were replaced by smaller French oak barrels. The winemakers took the best of the traditional Tuscan techniques for winemaking and added the things they had learned from winemakers all over the world. The result was a series of wines known as the Super Tuscans, world-class wines at uh, world-class prices.
Today, one of the new and most forward-looking producers of wine in Tuscany is Pier Luigi Tolaini, who likes to be called Louis. His vineyard is in the southwest corner of the most important grape-growing area in Tuscany. We are very poor. You know, the, wo the war was over and poverty was everywhere. I was 19 and beginning to see what was ahead for me. So I decided to migrate to Canada. And then I got a job working on oil rigs as a laborer. Then I bought a truck to haul water for the drilling rig. I was making money, you know, I thought that that was going to happen. So um, I bought this little trucking company and I started hauling general freight. And now we are the largest private trucking company in Canada. So when I left, my father heard me getting up. So I was walking away. I knew he was at the window looking for me. He wanted me to turn around and say goodbye, but I never did, you know, because um, I was thinking, you know, well, it's hard for me, but it's hard for him too, you know. Um, the, only, the only son, you know, going away with a one-way ticket, you know, so I kept saying to myself, I'll never be poor again, I'll never eat polenta again, I'll never drink bad wine again, and someday I'll make my own wine. The trucking business is doing well, so I thought that it would be a good time to slow down a bit and uh, come to Italy and uh, spend more time in Italy and uh, pursue some of the hobbies that I always had. And, uh, one was racing cars and the other was uh, making wine. So first I bought a car, a fast car, and I took lessons how to drive on a track. I entered a couple of races and then I realized that, uh, you know, 200 miles an hour, my reflexes were not what they used to be. So I decided that uh, if I wanted to die in bed, I should go find them. So I thought, plant your plants, your trees, your vines, watch them grow, make wine for your friends. And... Simple dream. Yeah, it was a simple dream. I chose this area because look at it, that's one of the best areas. See all those valleys, you know, they have the sun from sunset to sunrise. And then the heat in this valley stays there, and the rocks keep the heat for the night. So this is one of the best zones. Albert Einstein once said that imagination was more important than knowledge. When Louis decided to start a vineyard, his winemaking knowledge was almost non-existent. But his imagination was in top form, and he kept imagining new ways to do things. He noticed that bending down to work on the vines exhausted his crews. So he invented a tractor that makes their life easier and they work faster. The guys, they gotta get down here and they bent like this all day. So I said, what are we gonna do here? So I, I thought about this thing here and uh, you know, it's a tractor, it's um, a diesel engine. It's all hydrostatic. It's all controlled with the feet. So the hands are free to work. What the best thing is, they're sitting down and they don't use their backs. So when you're picking or you're pruning, you're here, the biggest bend you do is these, see? And uh, the productivity has uh, increased by 30%. He also produced a special container that protected the grapes from damage as they were moved from the vineyard to the winery. It also made them easier to move. When the grapes come in from the fields, they go on to a selection table. Any grapes that are not perfect are taken out. Then the stems are removed and they go on to a second selection table. The entire Tolaini family are involved in the sorting of the grapes. And they are compulsive about using only the best. And that's just one of their many compulsions. The grapes are kept whole, which prevents the juices from interacting with the air. And that gives the wine a much better flavor. The grapes continue their journey up and into a row of oak fermenting tanks. The key process in making wine is called fermentation. There's a natural yeast on the outside of the grape. When that yeast comes in contact with the sugar in the grape juice, it turns it into carbon dioxide gas, which escapes into the air, and alcohol, which mixes with the juice. The more sugar in the grape, the more alcohol in the wine. Taste it. It tastes like um, sweet grape juice. Now, when it ferments, the sweetness will go away and become alcohol. The winemaker decides when there has been enough fermentation, at which point the wine goes into oak barrels to age. After about two years, the wine from different barrels are blended together and bottled. New bottles are placed onto the bottling line. They're washed and dried and filled with wine. Then the air above the wine is pulled out of the bottle. The cork goes in, the bottle is capped and sealed and labeled. At that point, some wines are ready for shipment, but others continue to gently age in the bottle for another two years. 
Right after I turned 50, I decided that gentle aging was extremely important. The history of Tuscan wine has always been about deciding which grape varieties to plant and how to grow them. Cabernet and Merlot are traditional French grape varieties, but when they are planted in Tuscany, like so many long-term residents of the area, they develop a distinct Tuscan accent. Definitely riper than the consulting winemaker at Tolaini is Michel Roland, who is one of the world's leading authorities on the subject. I'm just giving advices from the vineyard to the cellar, aging, bottling, and sometimes drinking. Good grapes are absolutely necessary to make good wine. Sure. In fact, there is not good winemaker. No. There is mostly good <laughs> grapes. I began in Bordeaux in a lab doing mostly analysis, not really giving advices. And step by step, I changed my mind because lab was a little bit boring. At the beginning, the enologist was not really tasting the wines because people were not asking to taste. They were making wine like the father was doing wine and the grandfather was doing wine. And they were asking us to taste only uh, when they can think they have a problem in the wine. And so I began to taste the wine and I began to speak and to make exchange with the owners. And step by step, we arrive at the consulting. Pere Luigi's daughter, Leah, and her sister founded one of the most successful private wine retailers. She also helps her father and owns a national wine importing company called Banville and & Jones. And she makes her own wine. Donna Laura is my winery, and uh, I wanted to import a very good Canti Classico, and I couldn't find one that I believed in that had the right price. So I made one. I buy the fruit from my father, and I rent some property nearby here, and I use his winery. So Bramazia is the Canti Classico, and I had an artist do Venus, Bacchus, and Cupid on the label together. And this is Ali. Ali is Sangiovese di Toscana, and this is named after my daughter. And I have a Canti coming out this year. I have two boys. So I had to do a third wine, an Alteo. I have to tell you something. Leah and her father are extraordinarily competitive, and her father will not even allow her wines in the house, which is why we're filming down here secretly in the basement. <laughs> the harvest is always celebrated with a great meal. Often it's a family feast on the Sunday after the harvest has been completed. The idea of having a holy day once a week goes back for thousands of years. It was an Old Testament tradition that was adopted by Christian and Islamic cultures. After spending six days creating the earth and the heavens, God rested on the seventh and advised his people that they should do the same. In Western society, Sunday is usually a day of rest, but it can also be a feast day when family and friends come together for a special meal. The foods that are served at an important family meal must be different from those foods that are considered everyday foods. Very often, the recipes revolve around something that's considered a family heirloom. Today, the Tolainis are preparing for a big deal meal, and all of the dishes are traditionally Tuscan. The great cooks of Tuscany are devoted to a rustic approach to food. They claim that they are merely adapting and refining traditional farm recipes. But since the farm cooks produce some of the world's finest bread, oil, beans, cheese, and mushrooms, they've got a lot to work with. Julian Nicolini is one of the owners of the Four Seasons restaurant in New York City, which is considered to be one of the finest restaurants in the world. We brought Julian to Tuscany so he could help with the family meal. Here we have bruschetta made with fresh tomato, wonderful garlic, basil, and stale bread, but superb olive oil. Next, we have another different type of bruschetta made with fresh herbs, especially basil, parsley, garlic, and also some anchovy, very important, Tuscan olive oil, and stale bread. I like this segment. Julian talks and I eat. Next course, we have a wonderful Bistecca La Fiorentina. Bistecca La Fiorentina is basically the best part of the canina cow, which is locally grown in this particular area. We just cook it 10 minutes on each side. Just some rosemary, garlic, and a touch of olive oil, and that's it. That's the best piece of steak you can have in this particular part of the world. We always try to grill some wonderful sausages. These are pork sausage, 
You just grill very simply, touch of olive oil, some sage on top, some peperoncino, and you're done. We have a wonderful soup which is made with farro, olive oil, potato, and some mushroom. Nice. And this is the famous grain that this particular farro is made out of. And it is the staple food of any Tuscan cuisine. People coming together to prepare for a meal can be as important as coming together to eat. Thank you very much. It puts them in a relaxed and informal space. And it lets everyone make a contribution to the meal. A special meal served at home always contains symbols of togetherness and separation. Single placemats may be the norm for weekday meals, but a special meal always gets one big tablecloth. And on that tablecloth, which holds everything and everyone together on one field, there are individual place settings, individual dishes, individual glasses, knives, forks, and spoons. Individual, but clearly part of a group. The family table reinforces the idea of being together in a group, but at the same time, it can separate. It gives everyone an opportunity to show that they are a unique individual within the family. The sharing of wine at a family table is a symbolic act. Since ancient times, wine has been presented separately from other food and drink. Even when everything else comes to the table as a single serving, the wine comes in a bottle or a decanter, and it's divided in front of the family, reminding everyone of their common starting point. Today's uh, a special occasion, and uh, welcome to everybody, and thank you for coming. Since many of the members of the Toleini family are involved in the wine business, it is a particularly important part of the meal. The family meal puts young children in a situation that makes it easier for them to understand how language is used. They see people ask for things and get them. The children begin to understand the raw power of a phrase like, Grandpa, can I please have another cookie? The meal started in late afternoon when the sun was still strong. It ended as the sun was setting. A reminder of how fast time passes and how important it is to enjoy the warmth of the occasion. For Travels and Traditions, I'm Bert Wolf. the Roman legions had become so strong that they were able to crush the Etruscans and eventually incorporated all of Etruscan society into the Roman Empire. However, the great cultural traditions of the Etruscans remained in place. It was the citizens of Tuscany who triggered the rebirth of art and architecture that we call the Renaissance. Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, Botticelli, Raphael, Everybody who was anybody in the Renaissance was working in Tuscany. Tuscany is still home to artists and writers who find inspiration in the magnificent landscape and the unusual light.
Siena won the battle and entered a period of extraordinary power, power which rested in the hands of a small group of influential families. One way the families showed their newfound wealth and influence was the construction of magnificent fortified palaces. The city's location on the road to Rome gave it a commercial advantage, but it also made it a resting place for pilgrims. If you were on your way to the Vatican from virtually any part of Europe, you made a stop in Siena. The city began building a series of outstanding churches, towers, and public. During the 9th century, the Tuscan hill town of Siena became a major stopping point on the road between Paris and Rome. By the beginning of the 12th century, it was a bustling city, producing some of the best wool in Italy, developing a clothing industry, and exploiting a small silver mine. By the end of the 12th century, Siena was a commercial and financial center, and her growing economic success began to challenge the city of Florence, which was only 30 miles to the north. An emotional competition developed between the two cities, which eventually led to the Battle of Monteperti in 1260. About 3,000 years ago, a people known as the Etruscans migrated from Eastern Europe to Central Italy and set up a federation of 12 city-states. Today, their old neighborhood is known as Tuscany, and its cities are some of the most famous in Italy. Florence, Pisa, and Siena are Tuscan cities. The Etruscans had a highly developed society, great art and architecture. They also had a strong fleet that traded with the Syrians and the Greeks. They traded in Africa and in Spain. Etruscan tin and copper went out. Ivory, precious jewels, and textiles came in. But by the beginning of the third century,